Please give a warm open group welcome to Larry Clinton and Dan Reddy. So there's not, so. So is, uh, we do have slides. Is somebody forwarding those for us? There's not a... Ah, very good, thank you. This technology stuff always gets to me. Uh, good morning, uh, and it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to start picking up really where uh, Bruce left off, uh, and uh, that is with the notion that one of the things that we have come to realize in the space of cybersecurity, <coughs> pardon me, is that our uh, uh, this is a 21st century problem, and we are mostly operating with 19th and 20th century mechanisms to deal with it, and we need to evolve. Uh, some management mechanisms uh, that are dynamic enough to keep up uh, with the ever-evolving uh, threats uh, and, of course, the ever-evolving technologies. I think that's kind of the backdrop uh, from which uh, Dan and I uh, are approaching this. Uh, we want to start by taking a step back and looking at what is it we, really, we are talking about. Uh, one of the things that we have noticed is that uh, there's a lot of activity in the cybersecurity space, there hasn't been really a lot of thought about organizing that activity. We have noticed the problem so quickly. Uh, we need to respond so quickly. Uh, we're kind of running around. I mean, if you talk to IT professionals, they, they use phrases like their hair is on fire all the time. Uh, they can't stop to think about why they're doing things because they're so busy doing things. Uh, so we want to start this morning by taking a little bit of step back, uh, looking at what the problem is uh, and seeing if we can contextualize it before we move on to uh, the particular strategy that Dan and I are going to go into in a little bit of depth, uh, which is the use of cyber insurance, uh, which may be one of those uh, mechanisms that might be dynamic enough to keep up with uh, the sort of threats that we're talking about. And we begin with a realization that contrary to popular thought, cybersecurity is not an IT issue. Obviously, it has an enormous IT component to it, but uh, the main, uh, the, the number one threat that we have, uh, frankly, isn't technical at all. It's people. Uh, there's an old saying in, uh, in automotive safety that the, the biggest safety uh, feature in any car has always been the nut behind the wheel. Uh, it's the same thing with respect to cyber systems. It is the people uh, who are our biggest vulnerability, managing those people. Uh, and the uh, interconnectedness of the system, which we'll talk about in a minute, also complicates things. But it is not fundamentally an IT problem. It is not so much that the IT is bad. It is that the IT is under attack. That's a very different sort of problem. And uh, it's important for us to realize that at this stage, we're really not talking about hackers. I mean, we use that term all the time, uh, but uh, I think it's really an outdated term. It calls up notions of Ferris Bueller in his basement changing his grades and stuff like that. That is not really what we're dealing with today. We are dealing with the A team. These guys are professionals. This is their day job. They're really, really good at it. Uh, for a while, we have used the term APT. Anybody know what APT stands for? Yes, sir. Oh, no, but thank you for playing. Anybody else? <laughs> I love the look on the face when I tell people that. Actually, it used to stand for APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. It is now the Average Persistent Threat, by which I mean that the sort of advanced and elite mechanisms that we saw being practiced uh, nation state to nation state and some of the defense contractors five or six years ago, we are now seeing throughout the economy. This is typical sort of stuff. We are dealing with very sophisticated attackers. And they are attacking a system that is constantly getting weaker. Uh, we, uh, I see virtually everybody in the room has at least one or two mobile devices, uh, some of which you're playing with while I'm speaking. That's OK. Been there, done that. Um, but, uh, but we are now moving from a world where we have currently 15 billion mobile devices. In five years, we're going to have 50 billion mobile devices. It is virtually impossible to secure these. And by the way, all of these new technologies, these new apps, these new softwares, as you guys know, 
Generally, they are built on top of an insecure system. Uh, the core protocols that the internet is based on are open, they are not secure, and the bad guys now are going back and looking at those old pro protocols and finding even new vulnerabilities in them that we didn't know before. So the system is bad, the system is getting weaker, uh, and we are about to move into the internet of things. Uh, so we have th th the victims are in an extremely vulnerable position. And we think that it is probably a good point for us to take a step back and stop blaming the victims of these attacks. For example, Sony. Sony, by the way, is not a member of the Internet Security Alliance. I have no brief for Sony. I have no reason to defend Sony. And they didn't do that great a job with their information security. But they were attacked by a nation state. In fact, lots of people are being attacked now by nation states. Private companies really don't have the wherewithal to put up with attacks, persistent attacks that are nation state or nation state affiliated. But that is kind of what we're seeing. We realize now that we can't mandate security. Security is not purely a standards issue. Standards are important. Uh, we need to work on having good standards. But we can't mandate simply applying with a standard uh, and coming up with security. In order for us to move to, uh, from, uh, from insurance to assurance, so that we have some confidence in these sorts of systems, we are going to need to uh, include the economics of cybersecurity. Uh, a couple of things about the economics of cybersecurity. Uh, first of all, uh, many of the assumptions that we make about the economics of cybersecurity are faulty. For example, uh, uh, Bruce has left now, but he would have been familiar with a, uh, a document that DHS put out several years ago called the Cybersecurity Ecosystem, which was very similar to an earlier document DHS put out called the National Strategy to Secure Cyberspace. All of these documents said, well, corporations are going to adequately fund for cybersecurity. We don't need to do anything to, uh, to affect them because that's good business. Actually, the opposite is the case. Most of the uh, enhancements that build corporate growth, profitability, innovation, et cetera, from a technological point of view, tend to undermine security. Bring your own device to work, uh, long international supply chains, cloud computing, voice over in a protocol. All of these things dramatically add to the productivity of a business, but tend to increase your security problems. The security and the economics are kind of out of balance, and we need to understand that. So here's your basic security balance beam. Okay, Cyber attacks are cheap, easy to access. You can get them for a couple hundred bucks on the internet. They're really profitable, terrific business model. If you're going to go into the cyber crime business, use the same stuff over and over again on a worldwide basis. Defense, on the other hand, is hard, almost inherently a generation after the, uh, uh, of the attack. Uh, it's hard to show return on investment to things that you've prevented. And by the way, we don't have any law enforcement at all. We capture maybe 1%, 2% of cyber criminals. So this is our balance. This is the economic balance with respect to cybersecurity. It kind of doesn't make any difference what standards you have. If you have that imbalanced a system promoting cyber attacks, we're going to continue to have these attacks. And some of the assumptions that we have about attacks uh, are, uh, are faulty. For example, uh, one of the most common ones is, well, these companies, they got attacked. Uh, you know, their stock value, they're going to get penalized in the stock market, uh, and that'll teach them, and they'll, you know, redouble their efforts on cybersecurity. Anybody believe that? Anybody want to? All right, so uh, here's, a, here's a quick uh, multiple choice question for you. Uh, since the attacks on Target, their stock is down 20%, about the same, or up 20%. How many, how many vote for down 20%? Oh, you guys have target stock, I see. About the same. Target stock is up about 20% since the attack. Sony stock, same basic thing. So the assumptions that we're making, that there are going to be these natural economic uh, 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 moderators, really is not the case. So what we want to do is we want to move to see how we can change uh, some of those balances. Uh, and in this uh, regard, we want to be um, uh, flattering to our government policymakers uh, because they have been here in the United States uh, really visionaries in this space. Originally, I already mentioned the national strategy to secure cyber uh, space, but originally even the Obama administration, uh, of course President Obama was the most pro-regulatory member of the United States Senate when he was in the Senate. 
Uh, and, uh, and they came out in 2012 with the Lieberman Collins bill, strongly advocated, strongly supported. Uh, and, uh, and this would have empowered the Department of Homeland Security to set uh, mandates across the private sector, uh, broadly defined critical infrastructure uh, for cybersecurity. It failed miserably. And it didn't fail miserably just because the Republicans wouldn't back it. The liberal Democrats in the Northeast, and I'm talking about White House and Coons uh, and, and those people, they wouldn't support it because it was a bad idea. Because we can't set cybersecurity mandates and still maintain the sort of innovation and growth that we need. And if we set those things, they would be quickly out of date. As a result, by 2013, President Obama had completely reversed course. And instead of uh, promoting a system of mandates for cybersecurity, his executive order in 2013 basically adopted a social contract model, wherein they said, what we're going to do is we are going to work with industry. And together, we're going to come up with a set of standards and practices that we jointly believe are worthy of promotion. And we are going to urge voluntary adoption of these uh, standards and practices by the use of market incentives. Uh, this, by the way, uh, is very consistent uh, with the position that industry had been taken, the ISA, as well as the Chamber of Commerce and uh, Tech America, Center for Democracy and Technology, had already taken uh, a number of years earlier, and is consistent with the House Republican Task Force report on cybersecurity. So cybersecurity is perhaps the only really substantive issue on uh, Congress's agenda where the Republican leadership and the Obama administration are in the same space on a substantive basis. Um, so uh, NIST uh, developed their framework, uh, and their framework uh, has been widely praised. It was an excellent process. Uh, now we have to do the hard part, and that is we have to get people to do the framework. We have to find some of those market incentives that are going to drive voluntary adoption of this, because if we can make security at least affordable, if not profitable for a company, then they are going to do it on a voluntary basis. Uh, we've proposed a number of these sorts of incentives. The one we're going to focus on today is insurance. Brief history of um, uh, uh, insurance. Uh, traditional insurance uh, policies uh, uh, covering business loss came into place uh, in, the, uh, in, the early, uh, in the early days, by the 70s, uh, we had moved to develop specialized policies uh, for crime insurance, etc. By 1988, we saw the first anti-hacker insurance policies. Uh, and by 2000, we were seeing some of the early forms of cyber insurance. Now, there's, uh, it's important that we understand what we mean when we use the term cyber insurance, because it's used really loosely. And generally, people mean very, very different things. So you have first-party cyber Cyber, secure, uh, cyber insurance policies that generally uh, cover the loss or destruction of information assets, business interruption, uh, extortion, uh, losses from DOS attacks, uh, public relations re reimbursement, etc. And then you have third party uh, policies which cover claims that come from internet content, um, tech errors, omissions, as well as some of defense costs. It is that first party policy uh, which is we're seeing the most growth. Uh, a little bit more on the history of cyber insurance. Uh, by 2003, we were seeing the first data breach notification laws uh, in California. What is important about these laws is that for the first time uh, since there were uh, requirements in the instance of a breach, companies knew that they would have certain costs. So if you had a breach, uh, you knew you were going to have to uh, uh, offer uh, in some uh, coverage uh, for, your, uh, for the affected people. You were going to have to set up a call center. You were going to have to notify employees, et cetera, et cetera. So all these costs were identifiable, and that made it possible for people to buy and get insurance cover because their risk, at least their financial risk, was pretty easily identifiable. Uh, by 2009, we had uh, Suxnet. 2013, uh, we had the target uh, data breach, and it was the target data breach that really brought uh, the, uh, the corporate executives uh, into, the, into the mix. Uh, after Target and all the publicity about Target, uh, the corporate CEOs and the boards of directors became much, much more interested in cyber, uh, cyber security. By now, uh, by up to 2015, uh, we have about a $2 billion uh, insurance market. 40% uh, of the Fortune 500 companies have some form of cyber insurance, and we have up to 60 brokers uh, now offering this product. So uh, this is kind of a graph that shows you how the market has grown. The important thing to realize, however, is that this is mostly those breach notification policies 
not the sorts of things that our government is really concerned with, which is how do we cover critical infrastructure in case there's some sort of catastrophic attack. Uh, those sorts of policies have been much slower to move, largely because uh, it's very, very difficult to assess the risk, to assess the financial risk. Uh, organizations, companies are very, very concerned that if there's a major attack, uh, there'll be all this downstream risk, uh, there will be all sorts of uh, claims on the policies, and the, uh, the uh, effect of this would be to simply wipe them out. So if you look at what sort of coverage we currently have, really you can dump it into these four different areas. Uh, first, you can buy security and privacy and liability uh, insurance. You can buy event management insurance. You can buy network interruption insurance. And you can buy, uh, to a limited degree, uh, some cyber extortion experience. And we are seeing a tremendous increase in extortion attacks where people say, uh, you know, we've got your data, uh, and unless you pay us some money or do something else, uh, we're going to uh, do something to your data. Uh, now, I know that there's nobody in this room that the following example applies to. Uh, but as I was driving in this morning, uh, I heard of a particularly interesting cyber extortion case. Um, uh, uh, it's not Dolly Madison. What's the the, the website uh, for people who want to have affairs? Something Madison. They were hacked last night, apparently, and they're being extorted. So unless they uh, turn off their system completely, uh, they're going to let everybody's data out uh, for everybody who signed up with them to have affairs. I just thought that's a sexy insurance extortion thing to bring before you today. So. Wouldn't want to leave you with, uh, without that. OK, so what are the benefits of cyber insurance? Well, there are all sorts of benefits for cyber insurance if we can find ways to promote it. Uh, one of them is uh, ecosystem be benefits. Uh, so there are benefits to the nation. If we can invest our nation with a cyber insurance model, insurance is one of the best motivators of good practices. Uh, people give up smoking because of the insurance costs. My daughter studies harder because she wants to lower uh, her car insurance. Uh, we have constantly used insurance for good, uh, for the adoption on a voluntary basis of good standards and practices. If we can get people to buy enough insurance, we may be able to use this as a motivator. Uh, also, it's a good way to evolve the standards, hearkening back to the comment that Bruce made about we need a really dynamic motivator. The attack methods and the technologies change so quickly that we know that our traditional mechanisms, government regulation, et cetera, just move too slow to keep up. You can't write the regulations fast enough and then have notice and comment and uh, final notice and then implementation, et cetera. By that, it takes you several years and the attackers have moved on. But if, if the insurance companies have their own money and their own skin in their game, they can evolve their standards really, really quickly to deal with, uh, with upcoming threats. Uh, and also, there is a sort of smoothing mechanism. Uh, this is a funding mechanism that we can uh, implement so that people can get uh, their money back fairly quickly. Um, so uh, let me. Uh, there are some benefits here also to, uh, uh, to the policy holder, but I'm going to skip over them because I think I'm running a little bit low on time, and I want to move over uh, to Dan's uh, elements here. Uh, there are some. There's one more uh, issue that uh, I will deal with as I move uh, up to um, this, and that has to do with uh, the first of these uh, models that we have uh, that Dan is going to go through. What we want to look at is, are there ways in order to promote this insurance market? Uh, and the first of these scenarios uh, that we would put on the table is kind of the largest scenario, uh, and that is government becoming the insurer of last resort. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the government is de facto the insurer of last resort. If we have a cyber uh, hurricane, a cyber Katrina, or whatever, we think that the government is going to come in uh, and uh, take over everybody's policies. Uh, Unfortunately, they don't recognize that. And as a result, the government really hasn't stepped up. And because the government hasn't backed up the insurance industry, uh, they're unwilling to uh, sell these policies at a reasonable rate. Uh, and what we really ought to do is something similar to what we did with crop insurance and flood insurance in a previous generation, where you establish a revolving fund. And the government says, any uh, exposure beyond a certain rate, we will pick that up. And as a result, the insurance companies then can, uh, can monetize their risk uh, in a secure fashion. Uh, and they sell policies and give some of that money into this revolving fund that eventually uh, it is taken over. Uh, the money in the fund, the public money in the fund is replaced by private money. Uh, 
there's little prospect of that actually happening, but this is at least one scenario that we think would solve the problem. Dan, let me turn it over to you to move on to the other issues. Okay. Thanks, Larry. So I'm just, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to this current scenario that we see. And this goes back to what Larry was saying about the insurance today is mostly covering the breaches. So this seems to be a money maker right now. But if you look at the chart that Larry had about where insurance is going by 2025, I don't think that this model is sufficient because it is just focused on something that's actually predictable. There is good actuarial data because the costs are well known. If there's a disclosure of identities, um, personal information, et cetera, insurance companies know how to pay for that sort of remediation. So it's kind of canned, and they are doing reasonably well with this, um, this market, but I don't, think it, it's, I don't think they know what's in their future, and I think too many of them are kind of hanging on to it. So let, let's see what some of the other models are. So this is something that um, I understand is going on in the UK, where you have a group, like a red team, that comes to your enterprise does an assessment, get to know, they get to know all the players, and they are ready to respond should you be attacked. But it's an expensive model, and it doesn't really scale um, for companies large and small, but it may work for some. I'm sort of intrigued by it, but I think it's very much of a heavy lift. Um, the survey approach can vary from a really detailed assessment where you send out hundreds of questions. The thing, the thing about that is the insurer must understand what are the right questions. They must have the right people analyze all those results. And if I am an enterprise and I get this survey, I probably have to distribute that to all of my experts, get it all back, and then you have to have a rating system to take all those survey answers. My understanding from folks in the industry is they are, for those that have tried this approach, they are going to, a, they're looking for simpler approaches. They, you may get the same result by asking five questions or 20 questions rather than 100 or more than 100. Um, so I don't think this is gonna be popular, but think what you do in your enterprise when you look at your suppliers. You're asking a lot of questions and you're doing it all manually so it doesn't, it doesn't scale. This is a really intriguing model, and there are some private companies that offer a service where they will do a security assessment without your knowledge or permission. How do they do that? They go after your public-facing internet infrastructure, and they look for security configurations, security events, and they have their own private algorithm to come up with a score, like a credit score. And insurers are intrigued by this because, hey, we don't have to do the work, we just look at the score, and we get to see the relative um, uh, value compared to others. The problem is that I'm sure there's a lot of fine tuning that has to be done, and my guess is a lot of companies will want to defend themselves, saying, wait a minute, that's not really what my profile is like. Maybe I use a third party, but still, if your third party has configuration issues that impact against you and your IP range, then, um, then that could be an issue. So you could use, uh, and uh, Larry mentioned this, and um, uh, Bruce mentioned it as, as well, this idea of having standards be in, involved. The trick with standards is they are a good benchmark, but you have to have a good way to assess um, assess how someone is going to stack uh, up against someone else using this standard. So let's, let's kind of dive into it. So on the left you have, you know, everyone knows 27,001 and 2 series, um, lots of practice, security practices, but 114 controls in 12 groups. Yes, you can get an audit, but are we really going to have insurance companies go through all of that? Uh, and be able to compare apples to apples. NIST framework, uh, cybersecurity framework, great document, lots of value in talking about risk, et cetera. But again, five functions, 22 categories, 
you know, 98 subcategories and no standard way of measuring compliance against it. DHS has something, but not everyone has adopted that, but great. SANS top 20, you would think, hey, if we could only agree on 20 things, those 20 things are hard and there are no standard ways of evaluating them. Um, tying back to what uh, Larry said about the economics, if you look at some work done in Australia, they found four controls that are actually cost effective. You can make money by doing these in your enterprise. So why wouldn't everyone start doing that as a base? And then what you can do is say, you know what? I'll do those four because I make money there, but what is the incentive for me to stretch beyond that and maybe do the next four or five or go against some of the standards? So that's, I think, the place where uh, incentives can come into play to, as Larry said, to, to get everyone to increase the practices that they're doing. But if you're going to make it measurable, you've got to figure out exactly what you're going to do. And again, just going back here, you know, can everyone in this room do those four? Have you already done them? Do you have a white list of all your applications so you know exactly which ones uh, should be running in your infrastructure? That's a hard thing to do. But you can make money if you actually do that, and then what would you be willing to do beyond that in order to, uh, you know, to, to get to an insurance model? So insurance companies are really looking to qualify people and possibly give you something back in, in your premium. So that's really the, the angles that they're trying to address. Um, so really, I think what it comes down to is, depending on your use case and your perspective, think about these models, which one feels right to you. I'm actually interested in what Bruce had said earlier about lots of people or lots of insurers are starting to look at the NIST cybersecurity framework. I'd want to know how they measure them. Um, but I think carriers have to figure out where are we going. If there is that big business out in 2025, what will be necessary for us to get there? And from a government point of view, you want to offer incentives. I've been a fan of incentives for a long time, but they should be economically based so you get people doing things that make economic sense to them. So I think with that, we will uh, open it up to questions. Alan. Alan? So, uh, Jim Hightower again. You've got the questions, Jim? I do, yep. So let's see, uh, first one, can you discuss or talk about cyber reinsurance, identifying concentrated risk in cyber policies for pricing in secondary markets? Are we there yet or is this premature? I'll take that. Uh, it's... Uh, we are on the way there. Uh, it is probably premature. It gets back to the conversation that uh, that I concluded, which which is, how do we uh, how do we properly assess what the risk is? You know, and the and the problem with the reinsurers is they couldn't they can't define the risk, particularly in the. And I'm talking here about these catastrophic instances. Let me take a step back. I mean, what the what the if we're talking about these breach notification policies, no problem. The, Reinsurance market is there. The market is booming. Policies are being sold. Great. Uh, but if you are talking about what the government cares about, and the government cares about a massive attack on the electric grid, and the East Coast goes dark for three months in the winter, and that kind of stuff, uh, that kind of catastrophic issue, very difficult to assess uh, that amount of risk. And until we get a better handle on that, I don't think we're really going to see the. Uh, uh, the reinsurance market get in there, and without the reinsurance market, uh, obviously the uh, uh, the uh, the prime market uh, is 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 truncated. That being said, we are seeing movement in this direction. I mean, this is a hot topic. Everybody's talking about cyber. A lot of people are talking about insurance. Uh, so I think that there's more interest. But until we get until we can really do the economics on the risk calculation, I don't think we're going to have it uh, in their full bloom. But is that possible on a catastrophic event? 
Well, you, uh, you, you know, I, I think that it is possible um, uh, if, if the government would step in to their role. I mean, we had, as I, as I alluded to briefly, we had a similar sort of situation with crop insurance back in the Dust Bowl days and, and flood insurance. Now, this is all history dust, but uh, the insurance weren't willing to, to insure in those places right. either. And so the government said, okay, we'll cap your risk. Anything above X, government will pick up. Uh, and then they said, we're, we're going to do that by virtue of a trust fund. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the idea was then, okay, now this makes it practical for the private sector to sell policies, and then a right. percentage of each of the policy payments would go into the uh, trust fund, and eventually the public money was pushed out, and the trust fund is all private funding, and that, that would be the way that you do it. Now, there are massive problems with both the, uh, the crop and the flood insurance programs. You know, when you get into the details, we would have to learn from those. I'm talking about in terms of a model. Yeah. That's the only way I can see uh, it be done. And the ironic part of that is, as I said, the government already has this risk. I mean, you know, after 9-11, after Sandy, you know, I mean, whenever there's these massive events, the politics are that the government does have to step in, but they are not recognizing this for political right. reasons. Uh, and as a result, uh, from a risk management point of view, they're not transferring any of their risk. Uh, so it would be really smart policy if the government were to engage cooperatively with the private sector on this. I think eventually something like that will happen, but that's well down the line. Probably. Yeah, I, in, in my very early days, I did some work with Lloyd's Underwriters Insurance, and that you have a definable risk, and each name, each insurer, takes a fraction of that risk and then they reinsure it on. But the, the problem for the insurance underwriters is that it's not def the, the risk is not definable. Exactly, yes. Right. Yeah, and, and uncertainty results in right. higher prices. Higher prices result in right. fewer policies being purchased. Fewer policies being purchased results in lack of competition in the market, etc. Yeah. Whereas if you could get the policies starting to be sold by, by uh, defining that risk, as you say, yeah. Then you can start a virtual, uh, a virtuous cycle, where uh, you know when when the, the risk is set, then more people will get into the market. When yeah. more people get into the market, more people buy the insurance. The competition drives the prices down, and we get more, more I, insurance. I, I just wonder whether you, we we would be best served by starting with an area of risk rather than boiling the ocean and saying, okay, let's deal with all catastrophic events and all these big things. But you know, there's some low hanging fruit somewhere. Jim. So a, a couple of questions around economics. Uh, first, can you comment on whether security is primarily a technical or economic problem? And then how do we change the economics? Uh, is there a uh, economic market failure to, to be considered? So your thoughts on that? I think our premise is that it should be an economic issue, and it's largely been seen as a security issue. Uh, yeah, I think, well, there's been a whole bunch of research on that issue, you know, and if you go to Price Waterhouse, you go to CSIS, you go to McAfee, they've all done study surveys, uh, and the number one problem is economic. Um, I mean, there are technical issues, obviously, uh, but uh, the problem really is that you know we don't want to pay for uh, for security, and I mean all of us. You know, how many how many people in the room asked about the security on your cell phone when you bought it? I, I suspect it's a small number, uh, you know, and that includes our government. I and mean, one of my uh, member companies told me a story about how they uh, and we're dealing with supply chain issues, something Open Group's very familiar with, and uh, uh, and they uh, they went to the Pentagon and said, well, we can you know we can give, we can sell you secure laptops, you know, it cost you two dollars more a laptop. And the Pentagon said, no, thank you, you know. I mean, we, we we are focused on utility and cost savings, and so long as that remains our primary focus, as opposed to security, we are not going to have the investment. The federal government spends about $13 billion a year on cybersecurity. About half of that goes to DOD, so those are kind of offensive. It means we're spending six or seven billion dollars on, on what we could call cyber defense. And this is a problem that is a multiple hundred billion dollar a year problem, or whatever estimate you want to have. They go up to a trillion dollars a year that we're losing in lost value due to cyber attacks. We're spending a couple of Billion. Yeah. And the reason that uh, the breach coverage is so popular today is because boards are saying to their 
CISOs, what are you doing so that we don't wind up in the newspaper? And, and CISOs obviously know it's a heavy lift, but they also like to be able to say, you know what, for X amount of money, I can get us coverage so you don't have to worry about that as much. And it's, it fits into that scenario number two, and it's a win-win for today's world. But so to really get beyond just you know insuring against a breach, um, the insurers are going to need you know much more much better visibility into the actual risk posture that the company has, and many companies are struggling just to understand what their risk posture is, much less making it transparent to the insurers. So it seems to me that that's the the big opportunity for the insurance market um, is to you know, use one of your your other scenarios that you talked about and come up with something that gives better visibility into what the risk really is and what the company is doing to mitigate it. Is there, and some of the companies are doing that. I mean, AIG you know, has, a, has just come out with a series of products you know, to move in that direction where they're selling security with the, with the, the policy itself. I think uh, Zurich is doing some similar things. Lloyd uh, is doing some similar things. <coughs> Pardon me. The problem is that, uh, by the way, that they are being, um, sort of, if you talk to them anyway, they say that they're being undercut by Cut rate insurance providers, you know, who are not asking uh, these questions. You know, here, here's ten questions. You know, check the boxes, and we'll sell you a policy uh, because the policies are so hot. As Dan just uh, articulated, that people want to get into the market, and uh, uh, and so that that benefit of having them uh, better assess the risk and and help you become more secure is being undermined by some of the market economics. So. Yeah, I recently asked a vice president of operations who told me he had cybersecurity insurance, and I asked him what was in it. He had no idea. But he had presented it to the board, and he knew they had coverage. Or at least he thought he knew he had coverage. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot right. of this. this there was a <laughs> policy that someone signed on. Right. So the, we're, we're talking about insurance for companies, not, not government agencies, right? Not government. not government agencies as such. We're talking about companies. Yes. Okay. So we're, we're talking about companies. Now, in motor insurance, insurance is legislated. In health and safety, and all, a lot of it's legislated. Is there any prospect of legislation that you must have some level of cyber insurance? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I, 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 if, you, if you're asking, are there any bills? Out there, I know of none. I have heard of none being written. Uh, I think the uh, w there was a there was a watershed uh, event uh, with respect to overall cyber slash regulatory policy right. uh, with the failure of the Lieberman Collins bill. I mean, it right. was a disastrous failure. I mean, the the, the Democrats at that point held the Senate. Uh, they controlled the Senate. Senator Reid was big back for the bill. He couldn't even get his bill on the floor. It was, mm. and, and I think that after that, the administration pretty much walked away from any sort of regulatory <laughs> mandates for cybersecurity as uh, as perhaps bad policy and perhaps politically uh, yeah. uh, unsellable. And so they have moved instead to this voluntary model, the executive order, the NIST framework, uh, finding various incentives, and they are frankly struggling. Right. Uh, with finding yeah. what those uh, incentives are, largely for these economic reasons, and, lar and from my point of view, we're a big proponent of these incentives. Um, there's a certain timid timidry, uh, you know, the, within the government. They, they just are not willing to act quickly enough uh, in this space. The reality is, we have all sorts of incentives we use throughout our economy: agriculture, aviation, environment. We've got all sorts of really clever incentive policies. They simply haven't been applied to cybersecurity yet, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think we're going to see any uh, any okay. legislative mandates. So, if you extend the the target analogy um, and the the motor vehicle, you you expect to at least insure for third party loss, but in the target case, target covered all the third party loss. So the only beneficiary from insurance would have been target, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. A lot of the coverage is <coughs> focused on the first party and not the third party. Yeah, and for the motor vehicle insurance, the, the, the legislation for third party insurance is governed by the fact that the person causing the accident probably doesn't have sufficient funds to be able to reimburse, but Target does. I was uh, interested in watching the, the Sony um, 
situation unfold. Here you have the president getting up and saying to the nation, it was a nation state attack of North Korea, and yet it was handled as a private matter. I'm mm -hmm. sure behind the scenes, the government is working with Sony, but especially given the political climate that we're sort of anti-bailout, I wonder where the line is gonna be in the future. How big of a disaster would there have to be for the government to, uh, to jump in? Mm. We Jim. could ask Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, next question. Well, I'll pick up on the Sony one just to amplify that because uh, it seems to me that was a watershed one in terms of what the impact can be of, you know, wh when a breach happens. Um, it's, it's not just, you know, we lost a million records and it's gonna cost us a million times whatever the credit monitoring is, it's, you know, they shut down our business largely for weeks on end and, and you know, th there were significant business impacts. And I think that's, uh, one of the members brought this to my attention, that's probably what's got boards and CEOs really staying up at night is, you know, how do we avoid that one? Uh, where they really get in, they, sh they, you know, wipe servers, they cause massive uh, consequences to the company. Uh, it's a hard problem to, to uh, you know, get the security right and, you know, for the insurance industry to wrap their head around but how do you, even how do you pr price a policy for something like that? Even internally within those enterprises, uh, the remediation is an economic issue that's going to be played up against all the other business initiatives that are on the table, right? So the CISO comes and says, we need to do all of this and here's the cost and when you trade it off against all the other business things, it's like, okay, you know, you can get half of that for now. It also, I mean, when you, uh, and, and there was a, a, a really interesting article, I think it was in the Harvard Business Review a, a month or so ago that went through the actual costs of some of these high profile breaches. And when you actually go through everything, uh, the, including the insurance and the tax write-offs, uh, et cetera, uh, the amount that Target lost from the big Target breach that everybody, you know, uh, is like, uh, you know, the equivalent of their summer sales, you know, easily made up. You know, Target's fine. You know, I mean, people went back sharp to Target. Uh, the stock is up. Uh, so, you know, so some of these assumptions that we have, we see something in the news, we think, oh, you know, this is terrible and the company's going to go out of business. You know, actually, we're really not seeing that. And we're also, by the way, not seeing the lawsuits that have been filed. We're seeing those mostly get dismissed. Um, so this is a more subtle, difficult problem uh, than it appears to be. And that's why I think we need, you know, some of the things, you know, uh, for example, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that Dan was just uh, alluding to um, as to where the government and industry need to be working together. Um, mm -hmm. Kevin Mandia says that 90% of the attacks that he's working on now uh, he, are nation state related. These are private companies being attacked by a nation state. I don't, I don't know what the role of the federal government is uh, in those uh, sorts of things. I think we really need to figure that out. I'm, I, I don't know what the policy is with regard to that, but that's a problem. So a good lead into this question. Do you see the government stepping in in the near future around critical infrastructure threats uh, that citizens all depend on, you know, whichever the critical infrastructure sectors you talk about, water, electricity, transportation. I think that the, uh, I think that there is broad consensus within the Beltway, Republicans and Democrats, about how to do that. I think, if, I think they are stepping in from my point of view, they're on the right path, but not moving nearly fast enough. Uh, but I think that uh, the notion of a partnership between industry and government uh, uh, that is voluntary uh, and supported by a set of market incentives. That's where the administration is. That's where the, uh, the Republicans in the Congress are. That's pretty much where the Democrats in Congress are. So I think that's the path that they're going <coughs> to go down. Uh, and, and I happen to think that that's the right way. That's a sustainable model if we can work it out. But we are, we are not investing nearly enough on either the private or the government side. We are not moving quickly enough to develop these uh, incentives. We're really not even uh, doing the work that we think needs to be done with the NIST framework. I mean, we talked, I think Dan mm -hmm. used the term adopt the NIST framework, and you know, how dare you? I mean, you're not allowed to say adopt. You're not allowed to say comply with, or it's use. 
the NIST framework, and nobody has any idea what use the NIST framework is. Use the store stop, you read it. Uh, it I mean, use the NIST framework, there's no, there's no definition, and that's the signature program. Um, so I think we have to get a lot more serious about this, and I think we will, but we're moving far too slowly. Yeah, I was very excited when insurance came out as a defined incentive after the, uh, the president's announcement, but again, you know, here it is years later, there's nothing clear, nothing concrete in terms of how to do that. I know DHS is working to um, get people to bring in their experience from industry to create sort of this database so that actuarial information might be available to insurers, but that's a heavy lift. If they're gonna do something, they have to make it clear and simple and move quickly. Hmm. Uh, so, next question, do you think CEOs and boards are irrationally managing risk in their companies, you know, i.e., it can't happen to me? Uh, so, uh, we do a lot of work with the National Association of Corporate Directors, um, and uh, they are, you know, they are sold, okay? Corporate, right now, this, as of this year, and the, the research they do on these kind of things, cybersecurity is the number one issue for corporate boards this year. It surpassed. Uh, uh, executive compensation, which was the number one issue last year. So you know what, it's more important than that. It's, it's something they really do care about. It's now the number one issue. I think we have passed, I think we can spike the football on cybersecurity awareness. We don't have cybersecurity understanding. Uh, and I think the boards are really struggling with that. Um, but they are certainly interested. It comes up at every board meeting, uh, from what I hear, or virtually every board meeting. Uh, how to do it is is the issue, and that's, I think, what, what we're all kind of struggling with. I agree. I think it's a matter of what sort of confidence do they have with their CISOs and others that are charged with protecting them. I think they know that it's coming, but they may have some confidence, maybe because they bought insurance to give some sort of coverage, but um, that's really where it's at. Well, also. insurance only, co only covers the financial loss. It doesn't cover the impact on the brand or the, uh, right. the image of the organization. But as you say, with Target, it hasn't had much effect, has it? Target's probably more secure now than their competitors. Right. right. Yeah, well, they say there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, and, and the reality is, is if you look at virtually all the high profile breaches, those companies have done pretty well. I mean, they're, you know, I mean, corporations are experienced with how to handle bad publicity. I mean, you know, going back to the Tylenol cases and, you know, the, uh, you know, the BP, BP, cases. BP well, accepted. B, well, BP, <laughs> I, I haven't looked into BP. I mean, I, I would have guessed that BP would be accepted, but, uh, you know, I, it's, anybody check BP stock? Anybody look? You know, I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I can still buy gas from BP. Oh, yeah. Um, but but my, my point is that, the, you know, you can manage. Um, uh, uh, you know, corporate uh, bad publicity, etc. And I think the point that Dan made is is really important. You know, we come to these conferences, you know, and we talk to ourselves. You know, so you come to a security conference, you talk to security people. Yeah. You know, and it's all top of the top of the agenda to us. But if you go, you know, to a board meeting. You know, I mean, they're, they, they've got to talk about the merger. They've got to talk about the acquisitions, the new product launch. What's the competitor doing? Cyber is just one of the things that is woven in there with natural disasters and, mm -hmm. and other things. It's, and, and we have to understand and that, that our issue is just one of the issues and we have to find the appropriate place for it you know, within the, the corporate ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, and get it uh, resolved. So I think the, the real work we have to do is figure out how to do this. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I applaud the administration and the, and the Congress. I think they're on the, the right path. Uh, different, by the way, than the Europeans, who I don't think are on the right path uh, with respect to this. Um, but uh, but I can't emphasize enough: we're just not fast enough. Let's mm -hmm. go faster. Let's mm -hmm. go faster. Also mentioned in closing, the Security Forum has a project around communicating to boards on cybersecurity and risk, uh, where we're looking at helping facilitate that conversation and maybe a. Uh, you know, quantified uh, way so that uh, boards know the right questions to be asking other management teams. Management teams are uh, equipped to, to uh, present information in the right way to, to really help foster an understanding of the, the cybersecurity risk situation. So, I'd be very interested in anybody who's working on that project because we're we're doing a lot of work in that space too, and I'd be happy to okay. collaborate we'll with talk you. Talk after. Sure. 
And on the subject of the perimeter that you mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of documents from the Jericho Forum work on deperimeterization and the advice for organizations on that. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, they were talking about that topic 12 years ago, and it certainly played out that way that, uh, yeah. you know, perimeter-only security is, is uh, you can't rely on that model anymore. So. Good. Well, thank you very much. That's um, much to think about. <laughs>